Okay, we're going to take a look at the game Bull Run, published by Avalon Hill in 1983 and designed by Richard Hamblin. Now, checking Richard Hamblin's credits there on Board Game Geek, he's the man who um, gave us victory in the Pacific 1977, for which he won a Charles Roberts uh, Award for Best Strategic Game. He also designed Magic Realm, Gunslinger, and Merchant of Venice. He also assisted on many other games such as Dune, Starship Troopers, Arab Israeli Rule uh, Wars, and so on. So, um, Bull Run is the game we're going to look at. And, you know, it's, it's an odd game. I remember buying it in 1983 and um, enjoying it, but thinking it's just an odd game. And here it is, 2018, decades later, and now I know the reason why it's so odd. Back in 1983, when I bought it, I always thought that it looked like a game designed in the 60s. And lo and behold, as I later found out, it was designed in the 60s. It came at the end of the Civil War cycle, 1964, the Bicentennial, and Avalon Hill felt that it wasn't um, the best time to release another Civil War game. Their Chancellorsville and uh, Gettysburg games had finally slowed down, and I don't think they, uh, they just didn't release it. So the game just lay on the shelf for years, and then 19, uh, uh, 1983 came along and they decided to reprint it. Now we'll be taking a look at the board, the pieces, the charts, and I'll tell you a little bit about this fascinating little uh, game, and um, you'll readily be able to see why it is kind of odd. Well, a comment or two about the cover artwork. I never really got into that artwork. I don't know why. It just doesn't do a thing for me. I never cared for Stonewall Jackson standing, not on a horse, sword in his hand. They do show the wound uh, he got on his finger. Um, he just kind of looks stoic looking. This fellow with the pistol, just something about the artwork that never resonated with me. Um, I w just wish it had a better cover. Now the, um, the map, well, the map, what can you say? It certainly looks like a creature of the 60s. And uh, as we now know, uh, that's because it is. It is a creature of the 60s. It's got the Avalon Hill type graphics that were popular back then. Uh, it's got kind of a Waterloo, Battle of the Bulge look. The uh, hills have the little splash contours. Secondary roads are these yellow ones. Main pikes are in grey. Bull Run, of course. And uh, Centerville, way up at the top there. And... Manassas down here. Over to the west you've got Stewart's Hill and Gainesville is just off the board. So uh, the map was, um, I kind of liked it. There certainly was no ambiguity about the terrain and stuff. Typical of Avalon Hill in those days. One of the clues that this is a creature from the 60s is the old-fashioned term or time record track. In those days uh, the tracks often looked like this and you took a pencil and ticked off each little half hour as it went by. Um, we just don't like doing things like that in the present day. So what I did was I made my own little time record chart. And then of course I can move a marker across it. I hate to um, mark up the original sheets. The combat results table was a bit more sophisticated than the original Avalon Hill. You still have your DRs, DEs and exchanges. But... Uh, when we get to the counters, you'll see they had some kind of uh, step reduction. There's a special bombardment table, because there is ranged artillery in this game. And there's a leader elimination table. You really have on Hill Games didn't really have that. Your terrain effects chart is pretty basic, uh, but they also had on the map some of the terrain identifiers over here. But uh, the charts were the old style Avalon Hill, nothing really colorful. Now, Another clue that's from uh, a different era, and I like this part, is the good old order of battle uh, charts. There's the Union one. You'd set up your units here, and the Confederates have the same thing for them. Now, I'm going to show you the counters close up, and uh, again, you'll see clues that it's uh, a game from a different era. Okay, as you can see, the counters are not double-sided. Now I'm going to set up Jackson's Brigade here on the Order of Battle chart, and I'll be able to demonstrate what I mean. 
Okay, that's Jackson's brigade set up on the order of battle cards. And as you can see, Jackson, Jackson's brigade is composed of five infantry regiments and one battery. Now, all of the battery counters have two counters. That battery, standards, shows you the battery in its limbered status. When you unlimber the battery for firing, you would replace the counter with this one here. So, the curiosity for me is when they designed the game in the 1983, or rather when they published it, why they didn't bother going to double-sided counters for the uh, artillery. It certainly would have cut down on the number of counters. Because as you can see from the card, at the regimental level, there's quite a few units in Manassas. And it takes you a little while to set these counters up. Now the Army of the Shenandoah counters have this kind of off tan color, while the Army of the Potomac, that's the Confederate Army of the Potomac, uh, are in this uh, gray color. And you get Beauregard and Johnson, of course, both Army commanders at this battle. So um, I just kind of wonder why when they didn't publish it, they didn't update some of the concepts. Now, admittedly, only the artillery probably would be double-sided because um, the infantry uh, units don't have a second side. Although, um, I don't know, it's just, it's just a creature of the 60s and it shows its age a little bit. Now, even at this late date, decades later, there's a few little things I'm still curious about the rules. Okay, well the rules state that a brigade consists, of course, of its constituent regiments. In this case, Jackson has five regiments. But, if these units are on the same space, you can substitute these regiments for this brigade piece. But the rules state quite clearly that the brigade piece can only be replaced by the defense factors equal to, in this case, eight. So, Jackson could substitute these four regiments and put on this brigade piece instead, which would leave him one loose regiment. I'm not clear why they did, didn't make Jackson's piece a 10 in this case. There obviously must be some design reason why Richard Hamblin did not do that, but that's neither here nor there. You must be aware of that when you play the game. Now, the brigade pieces have certain advantages um, for uh, sustaining or receiving artillery bombardment, etc. As you'll notice, the brigade piece is slowed down when you convert to a brigade. Moving factor there is three. By the way, these numbers are the attack factor first, defense factor second, and movement third. And the red circle indicates that the unit is self-activating. There is a whole little command process in this game where you roll to see if commands are activated. And that's one of the little treasures of this game I do like. Um, the command uh, control rules are pretty significant. And for a battle like Manassas, uh, that really makes a difference. Manassas uh, was the first major battle of the war, and uh, both armies were rather green and untried. So um, that's how the brigade pieces work. And this is a dandy little game, I might uh, point out. I'm going to set up some pieces on the board and uh, tell you a little bit about the combat. Okay, those are the Confederate units after we've placed them on the order of battle card. And here are the Union. And as you can probably guess, it takes a bit of time to put them on the card there, because you're putting regiments down, individual regiments, and as you can see, there's quite a few of them. Now we're going to take a look at the um, order of battle a little bit closer, because you can learn a lot about the armies just by studying the order of battle, and it helps you to understand the game better, too. Okay, by the time of Manassas, Jefferson Davis was trying to organize the Confederate Army by state, and they were only partially successful by the time of the battle. You can see that Jackson's brigade is composed solely of Virginians, so that brigade was consolidated. Uh, Cox's brigade also consists of just Virginians. And Bartow's small brigade here of only two regiments is composed of just Georgia regiments.
the rest of the army is rather mixed. You've got South Carolinians, Louisianans, Arkansas, a little bit of a hodgepodge. Also, there's hints as to the order of appearance by train. Smith's brigade arrived by train, and attached to it was uh, one of the regiments from B's brigade. So you get little hints about the concentration of the army. Also, Walton's artillery here and Pendleton, they have their own little independent units, independent command. And the Confederate army is really just a collection of brigades. Like I said, the these colored units are the army of the Shenandoah under Johnson, and the gray units are under Beauregard. So it was a bit of a hodgepodge setup, because Johnson's army had only rendezvoused with Beauregard's the day before, still arriving by train the day of the battle. So the uh, Confederate order of battle is interesting, to say the least. So you've got to manage individual brigades in an army structure. Now the Union Army, let's take a look at that. It was organized quite differently. Oh, while I think of it, I should mention the cavalry. You can see that there's no cavalry organization per se. This little regiment here under Harrison is attached to Ewell's Brigade. And Hampton, which was a legion composed of a, of a battery, um, infantry, uh, and cavalry, um, it was kind of a, a strange unit in its own right. Also, you've got Stewart's First Virginia. Again, not any, no cavalry organization. It's kind of an independent unit. The red circle, by the way, means the unit can be activated by itself. Another thing I should point out about the batteries, it's kind of neat. They've got some uh, interesting symbols for them. You can see this little wee battery with sort of four little spikes to it. Probably consists of about four guns. And then you've got this smaller little battery symbol, probably consisting of only two guns. I haven't checked the historical order of, of appearance yet. Let's take a look at the Union Army. Okay, the Union Army had a division and brigade structure. So there's only one army commander, McDowell, and he has the divisions of Tyler, Hunter, Miles, and Heinzelman. And there's this odd brigade, McCoon, that uh, comes on later. So they have a division structure with sub-brigades. Now, there's something in the rules that is not 100% clear. Um, I have to deduce the rule. So when you set up the regiments into the brigades, for example, Sherman, composed of these four regiments and a battery, and there's the Sherman leader. But when Sherman goes to a brigade, he has this little red circle on it, which means he's self-activating. Now, the rules don't explicitly state so, but I'm supposing that when Sherman is in his constituent regiments, he is not self-activating. But when he goes to brigade form, he is. I'm also not 100% sure why they have a separate leader counter when Sherman is in brigade form. The only thing I can perhaps guess at is that if one of the units was lost and you had to reconstitute, you'd need a leader to reconstitute the brigade in a certain space. Uh, I don't have enough experience with the game to know if that was the intention of the designer, but it's not explicitly stated in the rules. So you get these curiosities where Sherman there does not have a red circle, but here in brigade form he does. Richardson, on the other hand, does have a red circle, even when he's not in brigade form, and he's got a red circle when he does consolidate. Porter, and I think the rest of them, no, Porter is another example, where Porter, when he's in his constituent regiments, is not self-activating, yet his division leader is, but when he goes to brigade, he is self-activating. So that's a curiosity that... Um, I'll only find out about when I play the game. So uh, that's the Union organization. It tells you a lot about the uh, armies that fought at Manassas. Now the setup for the game is semi-wide open, and thank God for that. I think it would be nightmarish if we were setting up individual regiments in individual squares. The Union 
to simplify things, is more or less allowed to set up north of Bull Run on this, on this road here, all along Bull Run, all the way down to Union Mills Ford and beyond. Now, in distance wise, that's nearly six to seven miles. So this is very much the operational campaign of Manassas, not the battle. The Battle of Manassas, as we know, took place really here on Henry House Hill and Chin Ridge. So the Battle of Manassas was there. But here, you're left open. All the campaign options are open to you as Union. Your main objective is Manassas, or these red star squares that are prominently marked on the board. For the Confederates, they set up behind Bull Run, and their left goes as far as Stone Bridge, much like it was in history. But, if you want to explore Beauregard's plan, you can do so. And instant wins are achieved by either side, for the Confederates, if they capture Centerville, and for the Union, they capture Manassas. So both sides are allowed to move and attack in this game, and that's what uh, makes it kind of interesting, and no game will look like any other because of the open setup. You've got lots of variables. Now I'll set up some units and uh, we'll take a look at some tactics. Okay, I'll try to show you an example of a simple attack and in this case the units are not using their brigade formation so we'll dissect the stacks so you'll get an idea of what's involved. Now, for the sake of the video we'll see that Richardson was activated he was activated because he has a red circle. So we'll say that Richardson's brigade moved into Blackburn's Ford and wants to attack Longstreet's brigade. And things get a little bit more complicated than meets the eye at first. We have a battery here, U.S., that's got a clear long-range line of fire. And because Longstreet is not in his brigade formation, the battery can pick out a single unit to do long-range bombardment. So we'll do that first. Okay, so the M slash 2nd US battery decides to do a one-to-one -one attack here on the 24th Virginia. Two attack versus two defense is a one-to-one -one, and he'll be rolling on this bombardment table. He rolls the die for the bombardment. In this case he gets a one, which is DB2 which means that particular regiment has to go back two spaces, one, two. And of course that will affect the battle here because the, Union, the Confederate defense is now two less factors. Now you are allowed to gang up on one regiment if you like. You can split the attack any way you like when you are in your regimental form. So I'll examine this and we'll see what kind of battles we get. Now this attack isn't going to be very good because Richardson's division on Blackbird's Ford is cut in half. And rather than try to break up into individual attacks, I'm going to do just one, two, three, four, six factors cut in half, three against the defense factors here, which is two, four, five, seven, nine. So we got a pretty crappy attack here. Now, odds-wise, that works out to a 1 to 3, not the kind of attack you'd want to be doing on a regular basis. So we'll roll a die, 1 to 3 attack, roll a 4, and that gives uh, an attacker back 2 squares. So it was a repulse, but not with uh, any great losses. It would have to go back 2 squares. That's simple Avalon Hill battle tactics for that period. Nothing unusual there. Let's just show you the same attack had Longstreet been in a brigade formation. Now in this case Longstreet could have been in brigade formation because the defense factors of all of his units 2, 4, 6, 8 equals the brigade counter. So we would take these units off, put them on Longstreet's card, and substitute the brigade defense there and with Garnett's battery. Now in effect the battle in this case won't be any different 
because the attack vectors, as we saw, were 3, and Longstreet's defense is still 9, which still would be a 1 to 3 attack. The difference is, when you use a brigade unit, the units cannot be attacked individually. Example, if that case where we had the battery here, bombarding Longstreet, it would be a 2 to 8, which would be a 1 to 4 attack, quite a different uh, result. Now the bombardment table only goes to 1 to 2, so if Longstreet had been in brigade formation, the second U.S. artillery here would have no effect on Longstreet. One of the advantages of being in brigade is it gives you a better defense against artillery. Of course you're slowed down in movement. So that's one of the subtle differences in this game. Okay, an example of another attack. Again, a not a, another good one. But uh, you've got these Confederates here, two regiments, 24th and 1st Virginia, on top of a hill. You've got these Union regiments attacking. Now, in theory, the Union attack is two, four, six, eight factors, and the defense is four. This looks like a two to one. But when all of the attackers are below ground, as they are in this case, the defender is doubled. So this defense is really eight. So in the end, we have a one to one attack. Let's do a one to one, roll the dice, see what we get. In this case, it's an attacker back two, just like in the other example, these units would retreat two squares. But let's say for the sake of argument, we had got an exchange result. This is where it's a little bit different than classic Avalon Hill. An exchange result reads as such. Each side loses defense points equal to defense strength of the adjacent enemy in the battle. The weaker side is eliminated and the other side loses the same number of defense points. So. There's only four defense points here for the Confederate, so they would be eliminated, and the Union must lose at least four defense points, so we'll take off those two. And these would be the survivors, being the victors, they would be allowed to occupy the square. And that's a simple attack. But there's a neat little rally system in this game, and I'll show you how it works. Okay, in this example where those two Virginia units were destroyed. If units are destroyed and they are within four hexes of their commander, they are not permanently taken off the board. They're put into this rally box over here, the edge of the table. And in an appropriate phase, beginning at noon, I believe, on July 21st, the Confederate commander can take one unit from the rally box and place it underneath the commander of the same brigade. So, there's a rudimentary rally element to the game, which makes total elimination not as bad as one would think. Nice little refinement from classic Avalon Hill, where units were destroyed outright. Now, if a commander, if when the unit was destroyed, the commander was further than four hexes away, let's say this was the, the case here, then if the 24th of Virginia was eliminated, it's not within four of Longstreet, it would be permanently taken from the game. So that's a rudimentary sort of a rally system and step reduction. Now movement of the game is very simple and it's very subtle, but it's also very interesting. And you can get into a logistical nightmare if you don't do things the proper way. Now in this case, all of the units are in command because McDowell is there and the division leaders are within command range 4 of McDowell. Command range though cannot extend across a major stream. That's why McDowell is in the middle of the stream there so we can give command to this stack and this stack. Let's show you a typical movement of a brigade crossing a ford. The stacking by the way in the game is 12 defense factors normally, but when you cross a ford, only eight factors can cross at a time. So in this case, we'll have Sh uh, Schenck's Brigade, under Tyler, cross at Sudley Springs Ford. Now moving along a road for units is a half movement point, and it always costs you one movement point extra to enter a ford 
square, and it also costs you another movement extra to leave a Ford square. So moving the second Ohio here into Sudley Springs will cost one and a half, and moving there will cost one and a half for a total of three, and he's got one moving point left. He could go as far as there. So that's a typical move for Schenck's Brigade crossing Sudley Springs Ford. But for the future, you have to watch your command control to keep these guys in command. Now let's get Key's Brigade moving. Now, five, seven factors have already used Sudley Springs Ford. So you cannot put any more factors in using the Ford because the limit is eight and we're already at seven. Unless we have a one here, which we don't. So keys will end up just going here and Sherman will end up going just here, right at the four. Whoops, nope. See, so divide the rules. You can only have eight. So three, six, seven, eight. And these guys are still backed up here. Now you can see the traffic jam as it can be ensued as units cross the Ford and exit the Ford. So, to put these guys in command, McDowell will pretty well have to be at McDowell right on the Ford itself. Because you can't have con command control extend across a stream. So McDowell can put these guys in command, but he will not put them in command. But Units only are in command if their brigade leader is within range, which Sherman is. So in this case, doing it like so, all the units will be in command for next turn. So you have to be aware of the logistics of this game. And I kind of like that. It shows the way real armies move. You can get traffic jams. And if you make one mistake in your command control, you might pay for it later. Let's give a situation where a guy is out of command. Now, if we had a case like this where Schenck's brigade scooted far ahead of Tyler, you'd have a problem. In the appropriate phase, you have to mark the unit with a special stop marker. Now, if you mess up your command control, you have the glory of putting a stop marker on your brigade, which means he can't move. He can still fight. So go into brigade formation in the same square if he has to, but he can't move. And that can be serious enough in this game. So the next turn, if Tyler was moved up and got in command range, and uh, you corrected your command control problems, then the stop marker, of course, would be removed, and Schenck would be able to move again. So uh, the logistics, command control, are very important in this game, especially in a game where you're dealing with regiments and batteries, under an army commander. Very tricky. Okay, the Confederate player gets in the game uh, four abatis markers, or abati. He gets to deploy them in his setup, and we often, the Confederate often puts one here near the stone bridge. And the effect of an, an abatis marker is to cause the enemy to pay one movement point extra to enter the square and another one to exit it. So, to move the 79th New York here, he'd have to pay 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 4, that kind of thing. So it's like blocking terrain, and it also negates the uh, road underneath it. Very handy for constructing your defenses. Another interesting option for the Confederates is the position of this trestle marker. Now, by default, the trestle here of the Manassas Gap Railroad was destroyed by the Confederates to prevent the Union from crossing it. The disadvantage of having it destroyed is, of course, that the Confederates can't launch an offensive easily across Bull Run. So in their setup, the Confederates can have the default, where the bridge is burnt, or if they want the trestle intact, they can put this marker on, means they can use the trestle as a bridge. That gives them an advantage. Of course, it also gives the Union an advantage. If they capture it, they can use it as a bridge. So that's one of the strategic uh, decisions in the game. There's lots of little chrome rules in this game, which I really like. Okay, regarding the strategic situation, all the units above this dotted line here for the Confederate begin the game frozen. 
They're face down on the board and they can't move. These units here are free to move. That's B, Bartow, Jackson, and Evans up near the stone bridge. And there's various mechanisms for unfreezing the units. They become unfrozen on the 10.30 turn of the game automatically, turn 4. Or they can become unfrozen by Union units coming within four spaces of them. So there's quite a lot to the strategy. The Union will want to move, threaten the Confederates, but yet not wake up the Confederates prematurely. There's just a lot more to this game than meets the eye. It looks simple, and it is, but um, there's some nice innovations, and uh, well, my only regret about it is, boy, I wish they'd picked a better cover for that game. But um, anyway, that's it for Bull Run. Uh, if you get a chance to play it, I think you might like it. Thank you for watching.